Two years ago, Monolith Studios released a video game called Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. The game was set in the world of J.R.R. Tolkien's Legendarium, but it told an original story set between the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Shadow of Mordor was well reviewed and received a long list of awards, but the reaction from diehard Tolkien fans was, well, mixed. The game wasn't faithful to the timeline of Middle Earth's history, it included some, frankly, unnecessary cameos from the movies, and some people objected to the level of violence in the game. This video isn't a review of a two-year-old game, and it isn't trying to defend the liberties Monolith made with their adaptation. Instead, I want to compare Shadow of Mortar with Tolkien's works to see if the team at Monolith stayed faithful to the themes of the Legendarium. After all, the real legacy of Tolkien isn't about accuracy to a fictional timeline or the correct pronunciation of Elvish, it's about engaging with the profound themes that give the stories so much weight. Does Shadow of Mortar follow those themes? Well, I think it tries. Intentionally or not, the developers drew on Tolkien's attitude towards free will and evil. The execution was somewhat shaky, but by mining Tolkien's work, the developers couldn't help turning up the rich thematic topsoil that the Legendarium is built on. Let's start with a look at Shadow of Mordor's story. In the game, you play a Gondorian ranger named Talion, who's in charge of the Black Gate, just as Sauron has returned to Mordor after a 3,000 year vacation. In the first five minutes of the game, the Black Gate is attacked, and Talion, his wife, and his son are all killed in a blood sacrifice. The ritual leaves Talion mostly dead, but the ghost of a millennia-old elf swoops in at the last minute to stop him from becoming all the way dead. From there, things get a little weird. The only way for Talion to join his family in heaven is for him to kill Sauron's top lieutenants. Except that turns out to be a lie. The ghost elf can release Talion's soul whenever he wants. But the elf has amnesia, and it isn't clear if he knows he can release Talion. Ultimately, they both decide to go on a murder spree through Mordor that also happens to be their ticket into heaven. Maybe. It's not really clear. How does all this relate to The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit? To find the best parallel, we actually have to turn to Tolkien's more intimidating work, The Cimmerillion. Specifically, Chapter 21, the story of Turin Turambar. In a way, the story of Turin is Tolkien's foray into Greek tragedy. The parallels to Oedipus Tyrannos will become obvious later, but suffice it to say that Turin's story deals pretty heavily with the idea of fate and free will, asking whether or not a character can be blamed for actions that they think are out of their own hands. Before the chapter begins, Turin's father gets on the bad side of Satan, and the whole family is put under a curse. Crappy stuff keeps happening to Turin throughout his life, and he thinks that the curse, rather than his own actions, is responsible for all the stuff that goes wrong. For instance, Turin spends his childhood as the foster son of a great elven king, but that ends when he accidentally kills an elven lord in self-defense. Thinking that he won't get justice from the king, Turin flees and becomes the leader of a group of bandits. After another accidental murder, Talion finds himself commander-in-chief of a different elven kingdom, but his aggressive military strategies attract the attention of a dragon and an army of orcs, which raise the kingdom to the ground. Later, he marries this beautiful maiden and becomes king of some humans, but it turns out the maiden is his long-lost sister suffering from a bout of dragon-induced amnesia. When the amnesia passes and everyone realizes what's going on, Turin's sister-wife throws herself off a cliff, and he commits seppuku over her grave. So all that horrible stuff is because of Satan's curse, right? And Turin is just a victim of some unlikely and deeply unfortunate circumstances? He certainly thinks so. Except, at almost every point, Turin's fate is at least partly driven by his own actions. That killing in self-defense that gets him exiled at the beginning of the story? Turin has already disarmed his attacker and is driving him naked through the forest when the elf dies. Even so, everyone, including the king, says that Turin won't be punished, so it's only his pride that leads him to join the bandits. Turin does a great job as general of the second elven kingdom, but his aggressive military policies go against the instruction of an angel who told the king to avoid going to war. And finally, he can't be blamed for marrying his sister, considering the dragon-induced amnesia, but no less than three people tell him they have a bad feeling about the marriage, and when someone explains to Turin why his wife jumped off a cliff, he kills the dude rather than accept the truth. Bringing it back to Shadow of Mordor, Turin and Talion's stories are connected by more than just alliteration. This tension between free will and fate pops up in the Almost Dead Rangers story as well. At three points in the story, Talion gains allies in his quest for vengeance. A group of escaped slaves led by one of Talion's old ranger buddies, a loudmouthed big game hunting dwarf, and the queen and warrior princess of a tribe of humans living in Mordor. Talion leaves all three of these allies behind to pursue his quest for vengeance, but the game hints that he may have more options than he realizes. 
All three of them try to get Talion to give up his death wish, and they have their own storylines which mirror the choices Talion doesn't allow himself to consider. The old ranger buddy is more interested in fighting a war than in evacuating his wife from the war zone, the dwarf is obsessed with fighting a great white beast, and the warrior princess is set up as a love interest that Talion has to rebuff. Most importantly, towards the end of the game, when it's revealed that the ghost elf is the only thing keeping Talion from being all the way dead, Talion decides to pursue his vengeance before passing on into heaven. And when all is said and done and there's no one left to kill, Talion still doesn't die. He goes looking for more people to murder and spouts some nonsense about forging a new ring. Throughout the game, Talion, like Turin, thinks that his actions are out of his own control, and he never acknowledges the choices he's presented with. But again, the execution is a little sloppy. Compared to Tolkien's characters, Talion is very passive. He follows the missions given to him without much of his own initiative. And it isn't clear if Talion really can go off with the Brodor for the princess, what with his terminal case of being mostly dead. And towards the end of the game, his choice of vengeance over death is presented as self-sacrifice rather than self-destruction. Which is a shame. Tolkien's approach to free will and destiny plays a crucial role in Turin's story, and it pops up elsewhere in the Legendarium too. It reminds us that humility is a big part of virtue, and that we can only understand the consequences of our actions by looking beyond our limited perspective. Evil is, in a sense, a failure of perception. We see this failure not just in Turin's actions, but also in Thorin's dragon sickness, in the corruption of Boromir, and in Sam's mistrust of Gollum. Virtue requires an open perspective. It requires us to acknowledge that the easiest choice, the most obvious choice, might not be the right one. The developers of Shadow of Mordor set up a similar theme, but it doesn't come out as clearly. I think most of the failure is in the media. A video game, even one that takes 20 to 30 hours to play, has a much smaller word count than a book or even a movie, and Shadow of Mordor rarely gives its story enough time to breathe. Exposition is kept short, and the developers clearly put a lot of their focus into the gameplay. And that winds up being a strength, not just for Shadow of Mordor, but for all video games. Gaming is an interactive medium, and developers can use the actions of the player or even the mechanics of the game itself to flesh out a story. In its gameplay, Shadow of Mordor also builds on Tolkien's thematic blocks, and there it does a better job of showcasing his themes. In the next video, I'll look at Shadow of Mordor's gameplay, specifically its much-hyped Nemesis system, which pits Talion against the Orcs of Mordor. That gameplay, more so than Talion's story, justifies the developer's decision to set the game in Tolkien's universe.